Anyhow, this is the, the third in our series. And this one, we followed last week uh, on the astronomers to who raised the initial set of, of questions that forced some of the breakthroughs. And in this session, we're going to look at mathematics, natural science, uh, and the mechanical universe, as, as it was known in, in the period. Uh, you'll see next week, we're doing... Uh, a session on epistemology and the problem of consciousness. And then there'll be a session on political theory, contracts, rights, human nature, and then uh, issues of secularization, relativism, religion, all sorts of things in the last session. Anyhow, moving along. So I wanted to begin this session with uh, a couple of slides on Isaac Newton, who is, whoop, I jumped ahead, who is by far the most important thinker of the period, and one might argue one of the most important scientific, if not the most important scientist in Western history, given the influence he had uh, for centuries. He lives as and he well into his 80s, he dies in 1726, and for nearly two centuries not quite, but nearly two centuries. His theories are the last word in the explanation of how the physical universe works. He's a mathematician, he's an astronomer, a physicist, and, and uh, a theologian, uh, surprisingly. And as I said, he is clearly uh, the central figure of the scientific movement in our period. His great book, uh, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, Philosophiae Naturalis uh, Principia Mathematica, the uh, title page of the 1687, the famous 1687 edition is on the lower right. There is a portrait of him, the Godfrey Kneller portrait in the upper right. Uh, this book and this masterwork, it's the crowning achievement of the scientific revolution. It was the dominant explanation of the universe, of the universe until we get to Einstein and his theories of relativity. It defined what came to be known as classical mechanics. His accomplishment was to create a physical explanation, not simply a mathematical explanation. He tried to show how bodies in the universe, whether they're bodies on earth or, or celestial bodies interacted. He wanted to explain motion wherever it was to be seen. And it was to be an explanation, the first great scientific explanation of everything. Uh, previously, astronomy and mathematics had been regarded as a kind of shorthand of uh, generating models that were useful for observing patterns in the universe, but they weren't actually physical explanations of the universe. So people like Kepler were saying, look, here are the motions I'm seeing, and here is some map that explains some of it or, or the pattern that it makes, but I don't know why it should be following this pattern. And enter Newton at this point. In fact, Cardinal uh, Bellarmine, Bellarmino, who was Galileo's inquisitor early in the century, had written that the Copernican system could not be defended without a true physical demonstration that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun. So in effect, he was willing to uh, inhibit Galileo's publications based on the fact that they weren't really a physical demonstration. It was still largely based on mathematical theory. And in the Principia, we see uh, Newton arguing at the bottom in that box, rational mechanics will be the sciences of motion resulting from any forces whatsoever and of the forces required to produce any motion accurately proposed and demonstrated. And therefore we offer this work as mathematical principles of his philosophy. 
for all the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist in this, from the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature. How do we go from the observable to formulating a theory of forces in nature, powers in nature, and then from these forces to demonstrate other phenomena so that once you've proven what the forces are, what else can be explained by them? So he knew he was on to something large. And his major contribution uh, can be summed up in the laws of motion and the law of universal gravitation. So on the left side of the slide, uh, motion. Kepler had described the elliptical pattern of planets, the fact that they did move in ellipses. Galileo actually ob observed this fairly closely. And he also observed, Galileo that is, the constant acceleration of terrestrial motion. Remember him dropping balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Now, Newton comes along and he articulates the underlying physical principles for both the phenomena, both planetary motion in, in the celestial sphere and Galileo's balls dropping off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, a single explanatory theory using famously using Occam's razor. If you can explain everything with, it, with one simple law, explain it with one simple law. So his first law, that an object at rest will stay at rest and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by an external force, inertia, the, the law of inertia, that things move and that motion will proceed unimpeded in the direction in which the, the movement has begun unless something else affects that object. This is not asking the scholastic question of what is the ultimate cause of the motion. It's simply looking at physical motion as an observational datum, as something that, that can be studied. Uh, we don't have to know where it came from. Uh, again, this is science doing something very different than medieval philosophy and very different from theology. It doesn't, it's not trying to explain ultimate causes. It's trying to explain ultimate forces. What is at work here? The second law is the famous force equals mass times acceleration. The acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force exerted and inversely proportional to the object's mass. Uh, these little animations in the lower right will explain some of this when we get there. I'll just go through these laws first. The third law, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That is, all forces between two objects exist in equal magnitude and opposite direction. So the beginnings of Einsteinian relativity as one object pulls the other one towards it, it is being pulled towards the other one equally and in, in an ops, opposite relationship. So when you think of something being affected by something else, that is you've already chosen a position in relativity. Because if you use the point of view of the other object, you're the one being pulled towards it. And, and so the entire universe in, is engaged in this web of mutuality that, that Newton was the first to articulate. Now, the, his law of gravitation. Now, Kepler and Galileo had no physical or mechanical explanation of why objects pulled towards other objects. Along comes Newton. And here is his law of universal attraction, gravitation. Any two particles in the universe 
attract each other with a force which is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And this is the famous formula uh, that you may have once seen in, in high school or college. Physics force equals uh, gravity times uh, the, the mass of object one times the mass of object two, divided by the distance between the center of those two objects squared. Or if you look at the curves, uh, the curve generated as distance varies. So as two objects, so we have M1 and M2, one on the left, one on the right, as they get further apart, you see that force diminishes along a curve because it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So this asymptotically, meaning it approaches zero or, or absolute no, not no, but virtually uh, no force as the distance gets infinitely far away. And by the way, and th this is just as an aside, we'll talk about it in a few slides. This is why calculus was needed. Two objects, thousands, millions of light years apart, still exert force on each other. It's just that it, it's approximately zero, but never non-zero. And only, and you need a mathematics that can start doing fairly accurate calculations as you get towards down towards limits. You can't, it can go out to infinity, but never quite reach zero. And, and so calculus will be invented as a mathematics of infinitesimals, things that approach zero all the time. As mass varies, so here in, in the lower right uh, animation, you see M1 getting larger in relation to M2, and we see the straight line of increased force because it's, um, it's not a square, it's, it's, it's a direct proportionality of the uh, product of the masses. And so force, which is the y-axis in, in both these graphs, goes up on the right in, in a straight line and, and, and not with this curve that we see in, in, in the graph of distance. Now, all shall be revealed. Newton's formulations explain unbelievable numbers of things that had gone without explanation up until this point, but that had been noted, that had been observed, that had been documented. So the laws of motion and universal gravitation explained all sorts of natural phenomena that had been carefully observed and documented, but were still mysteries. So for instance, the main one being Kepler's law of planetary orbits. Uh, they were ellipses, and, and it was the result of gravitational pull and centripetal force, the, the speed uh, and angle of the movement forced the orbits into ellipsoid patterns. And, and now we have an explanation for why that should be the case. That was mathematically measurable, formulaible. The precession of the equinoxes, the, the precession is a term that they use. There's a cyclic drift of constellations when, when you observe the stars. And the cycle is almost 26,000 years. Because of a wobble in the Earth's local axis of rotation, the axis you see the Earth down here and, it, and, and this wobble, that little circle that you're seeing is a wobble that takes tw almost 26,000 years to do the full circle. But it means that, the, that various constellations point up 
to a, a certain direction points to different constellations as you go through the cycle of 26,000 years based on this wobble that you see in the animation. And suddenly there was a mathematical explanation for it. It could explain tidal movements. It could explain the trajectories of comets. It, all sorts of things were, were suddenly ex explicable that hadn't been the case earlier. In a famous comment, Newton, perhaps slightly disingenuously, declared, uh, hypothesis non fingo, I do not contrive or create hypotheses. He wanted to argue, oh, these are not just empty theories. I try to stick very closely to the empirical data, and I only try to explain things that are uh, clearly closely linked to observation. So his law of gravitation, which is an invisible, it's universal and an invisible force, led to criticisms that he had introduced occult agencies, secret powers. Remember, this is still the world of astrology. This is still the world of alchemy that was looking for occult powers built into things. And gravitation, to some people, looked like that to people. This, this force that you're describing is invisible. We don't see this force. And a later addition uh, to the Principia, Newton wrote the following. I have not as yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravity from phenomena. I, you know, I've been able to do that. And I do not feign hypotheses. I don't want to make up theories that are loosely connected to what we're observing. I just don't know. It, it is a law. It is there, whatever it is. And I don't want to hypothesize or theorize. For whatever is not deduced from the phenomena must be called a hypothesis. And hypotheses, whether metaphysical or physical, or based on occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. Now, from a modern perspective, we think they do, actually. If, if, if you start reading modern physics and things like string theory and dozens of dimensions, and all of a sudden, it looks like we deal, physics deals in hypotheses all the time. But at this stage, the idea that you would play loose and fast with what you could deduce from or induce from observable data was considered by Newton a no-no. In this philosophy, particular propositions are inferred from the phenomena, from the observables and afterwards rendered general by induction. You raise it up to the level of a universal law. So clearly, though, the climate of opinion, this is a phrase that was made popular early by a historian early in the 20th century. When a historian named Carl Becker was trying to explain how the questions and attitudes of a given age didn't suddenly uh, refute the opinions of a previous age. They just ignored them. A climate of opinion is something, it's, it's like a different weather system that moves in. And all of a sudden, things that people felt were very important at a previous time and place in history suddenly didn't look important anymore. The angels, how many angels on, on the head of a pin is suddenly not a significant question. So the climate of opinion about science has, in the 17th century has moved very far away from scholastic metaphysics and which tried to examine final causes to experimental science and Asian agent causes. So we've gone from metaphysics and final causes to experimental science and agent causes. We, we, the question people want to ask at this point or spend their time asking, by, by, and, and, and as an aside, by the way, these people are still religious people. 
very much so. It's just that what they're doing with their active analysis of the world as scientists just doesn't mix with that in their minds. Uh, why is the universe here? Who caused the universe to be here? That sort of thing. It isn't that they weren't interested in the question. They just weren't interested in it as scientists. It just didn't enter that climate of opinion. And, you know, and I would ask you to think about whether you think about politics or anything that has concerned you over the last 30, 40 years, think about the issues and questions that were central 30 years ago or 40 years ago in the news and how we've moved on. The climate of opinion has shifted like the weather. Anyhow, Newton also does a lot of work in optics and he theorizes about light and he actually builds a better telescope. The so-called uh, Newtonian telescope is a reflecting telescope. So I, I use this image up on the right where, where you see the, the light is, is coming you know, through the lens, but is then reflected off a mirror. And it gets around the problem that, you remember the earlier telescopes, you had two lenses, and those two lenses, because color, light has different colors, have different focal points, there was a distortion known as chromatic aberration. And by using a mirror, he eliminates the distortion. His theory of light, which was that it was composed of corpuscles, and these corpuscles, and, and, and later on there will be two theories, a corpuscular uh, packet theory of light and wave theories of light, and, and but it's not until the 19th century that people begin to wrap their heads around this. At this point in time, if they are corpuscles, he needs something to be able uh, to transmit forces between the particles. And so he postulates an ether. And for the next couple of centuries, people actually thought that the universe was filled with an ether through which light moved, almost a medium. And a very light and visible medium through which corpuscles of light moved. Uh, and then the issue of occultism, he addressed his mechanical theory versus various occult theories. The movement of corpuscular light was explained in mechanical terms, but gravitation was described as action at a distance. But Nobody could give a mechanism for it. So how does this thing attract something that's light years away uh, without telling us what the mechanism that does it is? So finally forced to respond to the disparity that he couldn't answer that question, Newton wrote the following. It is inconceivable that inanimate matter should without the mediation of something else, which is not material, operate upon and affect other matter without mutual contact. So these are not billiard balls bouncing off one another. They're things attracting each other at a distance. So that gravity should be innate, inherent, and essential to matter so that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another is to me so great an absurdity. He says, this is an absurdity that I believe no man who is in who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. So sort of magical power through a vacuum without an explanation is an absurdity. So I'm not asserting that. He says gravity must be caused by an agent, not the capital A, acting constantly according to certain laws. 
But whether this agent be material or immaterial, I have left to the consideration of my readers. So what's he suggesting? A, a, a God in the machine, perhaps? He says, but whatever it is, there is an it. He says, I, I just can't argue for influence one object, influence another object at a distance without some mechanism of contact. So Newton's interest in alchemy could explain this theory of action at a distance, that he wasn't entirely free from alchemical assumptions. The, the great economist and, and sort of general intellectual of the early 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, made this wonderful observation, quote, Newton was not the first of the age of reason. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the, of the alchemists, if you will, the last of the occult thinkers, if you will, who, who was always looking for uh, the philosopher's stone, the god in the machine. Anyhow, moving on to mathematics in the period, because uh, as great as Newton's uh, physical breakthroughs were, the developments in mathematics uh, and astronomy were perhaps even more important. So we find early in the century uh, the development of logarithms by a man named John Napier, who introduces logarithms in, in 1614, uh, because there it's easy to explain, easier to explain tables that track planetary motion using logarithms. So logarithms are lots of multiplica multi-digit multiplications that can be replaced by simple lookups with a little addition thrown in. And a logarithm is the if, you, if you've never done any math, it's the inverse of exponentiation. So if you look on the, the right here, that two to the third power equals eight. Another way of stating that is that the, uh, the, the log of two, whoop, jumped again, uh, of eight is three. It's just, it's the reverse of saying two to the third power. So it's, it's the, the log two of eight is three. So you can you can reverse uh, compact those. So if you look at the graph of the logs of base two, uh, it, again, it's the kind of curve that can explain the certain planetary uh, orbital trajectories and the fact that you can logarithmically have a series that approaches zero but never gets there, on this case on the y-axis. And, and it doesn't meet. So it's it's so-called asymptotic. It's an asymptote, something that approaches zero but doesn't meet it. Analytic geometry was invented right in the heels of this, uh, in and by a couple of of big minds, uh, Rene Descartes, who we'll be talking a lot about over the next couple of weeks, who lives to mid-century, who develops a method called coordinate geometry, or as it's named after him, Cartesian geometry. He produced a method that enabled the solving of geometric problems through algebraic expressions. This is another huge breakthrough. You could explain, explain geometry algebraically. So two variable expressions, X and Y, can be represented um, as a line in a plane. So we have the famous X and Y axes of a Cartesian plane, and you can reference points along lines by uh, generating the X and Y values relative to the, to the two axes and place every point of a line, whether it's curved or whether it's a straight line, 
in a geometric space. A first degree polynomial, for example, 2x plus 3y equals 0, describes a straight line. And a second degree poly polynomial, which uses powers, describes a curve. So for instance, x squared plus y squared equals 4 would be charted as a circle. So suddenly, physical movement through space can be abstracted into mathematical formulae, a huge breakthrough. Descartes challenged a fellow mathematician, Fermat, the famous uh, author of Fermat's theorem, to find a tangent line at any point of the curve described by the formula x to the third power plus y to the third power minus 3axy equals zero. This is known as the folium of Descartes, and, and Fermat actually is able to do it, pushing analytic geometry way into the future. His solution, in fact, laid the foundation what, for what would develop as calculus in a later generation. So you see Fermat's born, Descartes born in 1596. Fermat is a younger peer. He's 11 uh, years younger. He's born in 1607. But it's going to be Leibniz, uh, Gottfried Leibniz and Isaac Newton, who will develop so-called infinitesimal calculus that, that really creates a mathematics for deriving uh, representations of both motion and spaces in a, in, in a universe that doesn't work at right angles, in a universe of curves, and a universe where things move in, in patterns that approach zero as a limit. Uh, and so, in effect, Vermont had anticipated differential calculus, and that will be the next great step in 17th century uh, thought, mathematical thought, anyhow. And we move on to calculus. So during the plague years, uh, I'll, I'll probably talk about this uh, a little bit in the next session also. But the England in the 16th century, England has a civil war that we're going to spend a lot of time examining a couple of classes, hence, between 1640 and 1660. As they recover from the uh, political catastrophe of a civil war, which was as involved as the American Civil War, they, in the very next decade, half decade, 16, in the 1660s, uh, they experience an unbelievably virulent plague and the Great Fire of London, one on the heels of the other. I mean, London burns to a crisp. And, and it meant that if you were of the social class that could remove itself from the daily activities of, of marginal survival, the kinds of work lives where you had to expose yourself all the time to disease and whatever, uh, if, if you were free of that, you were in isolation the way we are. Currently, and, he, and and Newt described the plague years as the most productive time of his life. He was locked in without Zoom, and and arguably with his books and and his telescopes, and and he during that period, uh, he developed along with everything else that he was working on, differential calculus and integral calculus. And, and these were, because of what he was trying to explain, he was trying to develop a mathematics of movement, physical movement, things in motion. How do you mathematically calculate things like acceleration and rates of acceleration and the like uh, as it changes in relation to time? So 
All the balls are in the air. Everything is moving. What we'll see, uh, and I'll mention in a bit, is that uh, the great German mathematician Leibniz independently developed differential calculus at the same time. In fact, modern calculus uses Leibniz's notation, not Newton's. And Newton held off publishing his results. And Leibniz published his earlier, even though arguably Newton may have beat him by a year or two. And consequently, mathematicians on the continent, mathematicians in uh, England or in the United Kingdom, were, well, it wasn't yet the, it won't be the United Kingdom until 1707, I believe. Uh, they were at each other's throats over the issue of who actually invented uh, calculus. So differential calculus first, just we're not going to try to figure out what it is. I, I just want to explain what it's about. Uh, it's the study of the rates at which quantities change. The derivative of a function at a chosen input value describes the rate of change of the function near that input value. The process of finding a derivative is called differentiation. And so it's called differ differential calculus. So if you take something that is in motion at, at a given input value, at, at a given point on, on whatever curve, given this formula, this function here on the right, this animation, at every point, there, there's a different input value of where it is on the curve. And, and you can calculate using calculus, using differential calculus, how all the other values are going to change from that point to the next point. So geometrically, the derivative at a point, uh, this is sort of a complex idea to wrap your head around, so don't make too big a thing of it. The derivative at a point is the slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function at that point. And there's a little tangent line here. And so the derivative is the slope, the tilt in that line as it changes at each point along the movement input uh, value of the function. Don't be confused. You have to take a calculus course for that. <laughs> there are myriad applications of, of differential calculus. The derivative of the displacement of a moving body with respect to time is the velocity of the body. The derivative of the velocity with respect to time is the acceleration. The derivative of the moment of a body with respect to time equals the force applied to the body. Rearranging this derivative statement leads to the famous force equals mass times acceleration uh, or Newton's second law of motion. The reaction rate of, of a chemical reaction is a derivative. In modern logistics and operations, derivatives determine the most efficient ways to transport materials and design factors. So all those container ships, which are being routed by supercomputers to ports all over the place to figure out the best way, the best way to get the stuff from everywhere to everywhere else using finite containers that are moving from different points to other different points and can stop in here and pick up coconuts from this place, can stop over there and pick up TV sets from another place, knowing that in a third place, coconuts are wanted, and in a fourth place, TV sets are wanted, and you complexify that out 10,000 times, it's derivative calculus that they're doing differential calculus to figure out the efficient modes and pathways for transport. And so it has myriad application. Integral calculus, which is related, but uh, slightly different. This is the branch dedicated to the calculation of areas or volumes or displacements 
of arbitrary shapes. It integrates or combines infinitesimal data. So for instance, in the non-animated, uh, this little curve in the upper right, it, so you take an arbitrary curve value and somebody wants to know uh, what's the volume underneath that line? Well, since anytime you calculate accurately, um, you're using straight lined forms, like in this case, rectangles, you could begin to approximate by calculating the areas or volumes of these various um, rectangles beneath the curve. But you see, they go up to the curve, but then there is that little space that doesn't get defined. And, and so you need a mathematics that can, can do this, making these rectangles ever smaller to do a valid and accurate approximation. Look at it in terms of the two animations. So right now, you see them, these rectangles getting smaller and smaller and smaller, eliminating the spaces that are outside the curve. It never, the integral will never give you a kind of an absolute one is one calculation of the fixed value for the volume under that curve. However, you can achieve an incredibly accurate approximation as you recursively do these ever smaller calculations until they, the, the, each rectangle in effect is approaching the zero point. And so you see how the, the more calculations that are done in the integration, the closer you are to a valid answer. So everything from the building of skyscrapers to the figuring out the volume of, of, of kidney-shaped swimming pools, um, you would use integral calculus. Leibniz saw that the integral was in fact the sum of the ordinates, the y-axis, for infinitesimal intervals in the abscissa, the x-axis, in effect, the sum of an infinite number of rectangles. You're just producing, in the first case, it's one to one, one to two, one to four, one to eight, one to 16, one to 32nd, and you keep on going towards infinity. And, and doing an integration. And Leibniz understood this, and he developed the mathematics of it. I want to point out that at this point in time, mathematics is no longer a shorthand. It is now a language that has encapsulated the laws of reality, of physical reality. This was the, the real beginning of a, a very unnerving modern experience that only this anomalous, arcane, esoteric language can describe reality. It was the first glimpse, and, and, and we now, as, as the products of future shock, we live in a universe where we understand that people who can explain to us or try to explain to us what really is the case, whether we're talking about the laws of physics or messenger RNA, that the people who are going to explain the mechanisms that, that reality works in are going to have to use a language that the person on the street can't understand. That reality has a language, but that language is arcane. 
and esoteric and not self-evident. Not unlike what the alchemists thought there were in, in secret, the secret knowledge of how things worked internally. And their world that was something virtually mystical. But now physics has taken on this kind of mystical quality itself. And I have this, uh, there is this etching by Rembrandt on the lower right here. I can expand that a little bit. It's Faust. It's Faust seeing the light come through the window, done by Rembrandt. And in, in Goethe's Faust, later on, there is a very famous German line, Dass ich erkenne, was die Welt im Innersten zusammenhält, that I understand what holds the core of the world together. I want to understand the world in its innermost, inner sten, so salmon held, held together. What keeps this whole thing together? Well, it's knowable, but it's not knowable to the common frame of mind. It's knowable if you can speak the languages that the explanations have to be expressed in. Anyhow, so we find this pantheon of uh, great thinkers have emerged uh, within the mathematical universe in the 17th century. So in analytic geometry, we have Napier, we have Pierre de Fermat, we have René Descartes, in calculus, we have Newton and Leibniz. And at the same time, probability theory is developed by very significant figures. The one you probably know best or know of best is Blaise Pascal and his, and his wager, which I'll talk about. But, but the Dutchman Christian Huygens and the Swiss uh, Bernoulli, it was actually a whole family of Bernoullis, but Jacob was probably the most famous of them. Pascal and Fermat corresponded about odds and gambling games and created the concept of expected value, which was picked up by people like Pascal, whose work on it produced his, his religious conundrum uh, of expected value. He says, well, you know, I think I'll believe in and God and play by the rules of religion because either he exists or he doesn't exist. And if I make the wager that he does and he doesn't exist, well, I don't really lose much by that. But if I reverse that and if I if I assume I make I assume that the expected value is that he doesn't exist, but he does, and I have lived this profligate life. Well, I've got a penalty to pay, and therefore I better play by the rules. So, mathematically, though, with Huygens and Bernoulli, a foundation for a mathematics of probability begins to take shape. So Bernoulli proved a version of the law of large numbers, that the average of the outcomes is likely to be very close to the expected value. So, you know, if you flip the coin, you know, a billion times and your expected value is, is you're, you're expecting a kind of 50-50 random allocation, um, well, if you flip the coin a billion times, you're going to be pretty close. Uh, and any set less than that, if it's not a large number, you're not going, uh, you're going to find a lot of anomalies. There was a, a couple of years ago, somebody had dedicated a supercomputer to looking for patterns in the calculation of the digits of pi you know, the 3.1412 ad infinitum that people use as one of the constants in calculating certain areas like of circles. And, and the people who had put together the calculation that took it out to like trillions of digits, 
said, in fact, they had written software to analyze the results of their calculation of the multiple digits to see if there were patterns that they could say were significant. And as one of were two brothers, they were Russian brothers who, who had done this. And one of them pointed out, you know, you would think, for instance, there's at one point where the digit one repeats something like a hundred consecutive times. And, and you would think uh, that maybe you were onto some kind of a pattern. He says, but no, we weren't. So the reason this becomes very significant is that scientific theory is going to become closely allied with probability, probable outcomes. And, and Dave, it's going to await David Hume to explain that all predictability is really a matter of probable outcomes, as long as a relationship is not a priori, which means mathematically certain, like a circle can't be square kind of thing, as long as it's not that way, but it's, is to be expected on the basis of observations even something very assured isn't absolutely the case. It's just got a high probability factor. And, and he says, that's all we can know since we don't know the underlying cause. Anyhow, but science and things like Bayesian probability theory are, are closely aligned as we get into later science and later mathematics. So beyond astronomy, beyond physics and beyond mathematics, we have other sciences that are uh, a boil. They are rising to the top of the 17th century attention field. And in medicine and anatomy, we have people like William Harvey, who discovered the heart's role in circulating blood, that it wasn't the ancient humor theory and the liver is the source of blood, as had been uh, the case, you know, the theory for 2000 years. He was a champion of anatomical dissection. And indeed, in uh, the painting of the Dutch Golden Age, several paintings, and I'll show you one at the end of the session, uh, you often see anatomy lessons and dissections as the topic, artists decided that this was a, a very useful subject area for their painting. And, and so uh, here is a seventh century depiction uh, arguing for the motion of the heart, the pumping of blood through the arterials and venous systems. In chemistry, Robert Boyle, entirely in the 17th century, uh, his lifespan, considered the first modern chemist, formulator of Boyle's Law, as it's called, which states that the inversely proportional relationship, a inversely proportional relationship uh, between pressure and the volume of a gas, as long as the mass and temperature stay constant. So here is the volume on the y-axis, and pressure on the x-axis with everything else constant, and, and it shows the relationship of those two, and which is going to be very significant for the development of things like the steam engine, which is happening virtually as we speak at this point in the 17th century. In his book, The Skeptical Chemist, Boyle hypothesizes that a theory of matter based on um, particles in motion, a kind of atomic theory is the case. Every phenomenon was the result of collisions of these corpuscles, which is a direct challenge to Aristotle's element theory that there are, you know, there's fire and earth and water, etc. Here we have a return to, to atomism, which the ancient, some ancients had argued, but now there is more evidence to support it. Uh, microscopes get developed and microbiology becomes a field. So Robert Hooke invented microscopic studies of, along with a, a famous Italian who I'll point to later on, 
And, and he was the first to visualize microorganisms. He saw them under the microscope. Uh, the Dutchman, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, he did microscopic studies and these beautiful, I, I didn't include any of his, um, of the artwork that represented early pictures of bacteria, and but also muscle fibers and blood cells and, and was able to fairly accurately estimate their size. And here's a, an image of um, Hooks, Robert Hooks, uh, early microscope. Again, lenses and optics were an obsession with a lot of these guys. And I should point out, is a lot of these folks were involved in several types of scientific or mathematical studies. This is in, a, in that box at the bottom. I call this science without borders. This was an age before the development of separate disciplines. One wasn't a chemist, standalone, or you know, a subset, organic chemist or an inorganic chemist. These guys were polymaths. They were learning the rules of, of science and the mathematization of those rules and, and developing technological breakthroughs based on them all over the lot. They, their theories would trigger thoughts in what we would think of as other areas of science or other, other subject areas of mathematics, and, and off they would go to the races. So remember, it, this is not quite, we're not quite there yet, but in the 18th century, because this was Still largely the case, even if in the 18th century, the idea that somebody could know everything about everything was already, you know, the death knell had been sounded by the 18th century. But the 18th century was a period of people beginning to publish encyclopedias and Kiklios Paideia, the circle of learning, attempts to gather all the knowledge in the world about every subject and jamming it up between two covers or under one roof so that we find, we find uh, the French encyclopedists of, of the second half of the 18th century stimulating attempts like Britannica with its early editions in like 1810 and periods like that. The, the minute encyclopedism as an idea develops, it is too late. It's already not a valid theory at that point. But the idea that, that this tradition from the 17th century, that that you could dabble in everything and that there were common principles underlying everything and you could know everything was, was afoot. Anyhow, mechanical philosophy, materialism and the mechanical universe. Now, there had been ancient Greek atomists and some Stoics, another school of philosophy in the ancient world, that held that the universe is reducible to completely mechanical principles. That is the motion and collision of matter. The dominance of Platonic and Christian thought in the Middle Ages, however, shifted the intellectual focus away from materialism. Now, the impact of 17th century science is going to return the focus to materialism, that you could explain a lot about the universe entirely as if it were a machine. The revolution in astronomy, the advances in applied mathematics, the explicative power of Newtonian physics resurrected the idea that all phenomena could be explained through the motion of matter. One half step from that position and you could fall into a determinist theory of the universe, which many did, the so-called clockwork universe. 
if the laws of the universe can be predictably explained, the universe itself can be considered a machine or in the parlance of state-of-the-art 17th century technology, a clock. So the great clock theory of the universe with all the, the moving parts, with all the little cogs and all the little gears was really first proposed in, in modern form in the 17th century. So the term mechanical philosophers, which was a term invented by Boyle, came to refer to any thinkers with a determinist uh, view of the universe. And here is one of those orreries where all the planets, you know, you turn a mechanism and all these little balls follow. There are all the different planets and moons in our solar system, and they and they all follow in the planetary motion. And the orrery was a kind of, you know, parlor version of the way the entire universe allegedly worked. A later Enlightenment figure, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, so this is now, he's an 18th century figure. He succinctly summarized the mechanical thesis. We may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of the past and the cause of the future. So in relation to the past, it's an effect. In relation to the future, it's a cause. An intellect which at any given moment knew all of the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that compose it, if this intellect were vast enough to submit the data to analysis, like the mind of God, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and that of the lightest atom. For such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So if you had a mind so capacious that you could know all the forces at work, you would know the outcomes. You would know the future. When we get into the modern world issue of things like artificial intelligence, there are some people who argue that the machines will be capable of the greatest leaps of thought because we are all at heart mechanisms and the mechanism that is the computer or the basis of artificial intelligence will be able to complexify and complexify and complexify until it can surpass the calculation of what is to be better than we can ourselves and that and that the future the future is with the machines there were also in the 18th century uh, and this included by the way the majority of the founding fathers of, of the United States, a, there was a religious sensibility uh, that was called deism that believed that you probably needed a causal God to start the ball rolling, but that this wasn't the God of the New Testament and the Old Testament or the Bible or the Quran who intervenes in human activity every step of the way. This was a God who just built the machine. And then the machine runs by its own rules and, 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 and the God sort of walked away or he's at a distance, that he's not this personal God who you have private conversations with every, every moment in prayer or whatever, that it's basically a principle that begins in motion, and in the last session that we do for this class, I'll, I'll, I'll probably talk about Baruch Spinoza, the great Jewish philosopher of the 17th century, um, who has something to say about this. And, and but this was this was a common idea among the intelligentsia of the 17th century that that determinism was possible. Now. The Royal Society of London was instrumental in the publication and the sharing of breakthrough ideas. This was accompanied by, by other societies in France and, and, and in Holland. 
Uh, I just point to this one because it was it was the most influential of of the of the scientific society. It was more than scientific. It, 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 intellectuals of every order were welcome to the Royal Society. The transmission and dissemination of scientific and technological breakthroughs was enhanced by the Royal Society that had in its journal, the oldest continuous science publication. Robert Boyle and Christopher Wren, the famous um, architect and another polymath, were among the founding members. Newton's Principia Mathematica was published by the society. And here is a frontispiece from 1665, 1666, volume one. And I took every... I took everything, uh, the verbiage from this page and, and typed it out so you could read it more easily. This says, the philosophical transactions giving some accounts of the present undertakings, studies, and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. So you, could, you could submit breakthrough articles from wherever you were and the journal of the society would print it. Here's a, a woodcut of an early meeting. This is uh, Newton seated at one of the early meetings. Here's Christopher Wren as president of the society in 1680 to 1682. The Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, as it was called. The society was international in scope, establishing relationships with Dutch, French, German, and Italian scientists publishing their findings. Leven Hooke's uh, superior microscope, the, the Dutchman who improved microscopic uh, construction, for example, first achieved recognition in the journal, and then there was such a demand for it that, that he was able to make a living off supplying these to other people. Um, the society's motto is interesting, Nullius in verba, which is hard to translate sort of, of nothing in verb, in words, uh, or somebody suggested on the internet that you could best translate it as take nobody's word for it, uh, nicely encapsulates this new spirit of inquiry, skepticism, experimentation. So the club, the Royal Society was open to celebrities in every field. In addition to scientists, there were poets, uh, there were physicians, philosophers, businessmen, clergy, politicians, aristocrats, Charles II and James II. Um, the kings were, were fellows. John Dryden, the great poet, Samuel Pepys was one of the presidents actually. Anthony Ashley Cooper, uh, who was a philosopher who we might get a chance to um, address in later sessions. John Winthrop of, of um, the New England colony in the Americas was, he was the first, what was he? He was the first like president of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or whatever. Um, was a member. Among the scientists, I took another famous um, portrait of Newton, not the one that they usually show. That's the one I showed a few pages ago. And Robert Boyle, Robert Hooke, Christian Huygens, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, and I believe, what does he have there? Does he have one of his microscopes there? A uh, Marcello Malpighi, who was a microbiologist of some note in Italy at the time. Uh, Gottfried Leibniz, Edmund Halley, Christopher Wren. I include John Locke because of his publications. Of, it isn't so much that he's a scientist, but he's a great commentator on uh, the epistemology that underlies science, empirical theory. And that is something that we will talk about a lot later on. Um, and finally, and I'm actually ending early today by a bit. Um, one of the 
studies, of which there are dozens in the period, this is one of Rembrandt's famous ones, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp, the, the Dutch Republic in, in, in the Golden Age and the, the Dutch universities in this period were um, exceptionally progressive and scientific research at the universities uh, was unparalleled. They were, a, being a republic, they were a fairly open society that allowed the publication of books that would have been censored in London or Rome or Paris for that matter. And indeed, many of the French philosophes of the following century would, when, when uh, the, the great Enlightenment censor, uh, Malzerbe, who was a friend of several of the philosophes, would tip friends off who were authors that he was going to have to censor their work because it was going to offend the Catholic hierarchy or the, the royal house whomever, they would uh, trot off and have it published in Amsterdam or Leiden or, or Rotterdam. It was common uh, even for, but, but even for religious books that were written by people whose theology was considered suspect by people in other cultures, where there, were, where there was radical uh, Protestant publications could get published there. And, and so the spirit not only had printing emerged, but the apparatus, the social apparatus of printing and, and dissemination and publication, this is the period in which things like uh, broadsides were developed, broadside newspapers in England, you know, the early days of things like the Spectator and the Tatler and things like this, where you could get a penny sheet that would apprise you of a number of things that were happening in and around town uh, in an age when information was, was not totally available, supported the spreading of scientific theories, supported the spread of, of religious ideas and, and became the model for things like the Royal Society. Let's publish anything that anybody want, might want to hear about in this period. And you get um, Dutch theorists in this period who, for instance, were arguing that there must be consistency throughout the universe, that if a physical law applied in our arena, it also had to govern uniformly the way things worked in other parts of the universe, which became a, a prime given of modern science until the 21st century, when all of a sudden some of this gets called into question. But until we get to the Einstein and all of the developments in, in quantum physics and string theory and the, and the kinds of mathematics that underlie that in the 21st century, um, we're going to find that the Newtonian universe of calculus, of the, the great mechanical theory of the 17th century held in place and explained fairly nicely the world as people knew it until it got suddenly more arcane yet again. Anyhow, um, that's it for this week. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to un in myself. And if anybody
as questions. You can unmute yourself and and ask away. I realize how technical. I, Lou, uh, yeah. not, te not technical, but it's, it appears to me that grinding glass in lenses gave impetus to what came afterwards in, in various uh, areas uh, of scientific knowledge and mathematical law. That's true. It was, and it's amazing how many of these folk were interested in optics. Certainly all the astronomers, but then even, you know, even Newton, all the microscopic people, they got very close to it. And of course, the optics were simple enough if you had a good lens grinder nearby or you could do it yourself. The optics produced machines that you could build yourself. This was, you know, the, the DIY, the do-it-yourself universe of, of scientists. Anyhow, um, I want to remind everyone that uh, we have three sessions left. This was the last one on science is science. Uh, the fourth session, which we do next week, is on the philosophy of knowledge and the problem of consciousness, epistemology and consciousness. And then there's a week off for election day. And then we do two sessions following that on the 9th and 16th of November. And one is on the revolution political theory and the other one is on uh, increased secularization and crises that this elicits in the 17th century. And that will be it for us. So do we have anything else or shall we call it an afternoon? Well, just want to thank you for uh, bringing me back to my high school physics and chemistry <laughs> classes. <laughs> Calculus. <laughs> I understand. And, and reminding me of what I didn't understand then, nor do I understand now. <laughs> uh, hey, Lou, I have a question about that, that last painting with Rembrandt. Why did right. it seem like all the participants were looking at the book instead of watching the physician? That's a good question. Let me bring that guy up again. Wait a minute. Let me. I am going to return to, if I can, share. I'm going to return to share screen. And, and let me go down to that slide. Oh, there we go. Can you you can all, can all see that? Yes. So there, I think they're looking at the book because someone has already written up the theory of the musculature. Maybe Dr. Top himself. And this is a live demonstration of what's in the text. So in effect, it's a hands-on lab, but he's pointed out that you could, you could have learned this from the text itself. That's my guess. Makes sense, thanks. Perhaps he was pointing out an error in the book. Perhaps he was pointing out an error in the book. Yeah, sure. <laughs>
Yeah. So the, that painting is uh, on display in Amsterdam. Is that correct? I'm not sure where it is. I could, you could, you could Google look that. up doc, look up the Doctor Tolk, and, yeah. and 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 Wikipedia. It'll tell you which Very museum. <laughs> Yeah, I often show things, uh, use the artwork of the period without mentioning uh, where these things reside because that wind up in a really complicated universe if I were pointing to every museum in Europe. Deborah Geltman has a question. You're not on audio. Yeah. I'm mute. Okay, here I am. Okay. Yeah. So here's my question. Um, what was the general population thinking of any of this stuff? Were they aware of it? Was it talked about in like newspapers? Um, were they um, fascinated by it? Were they or they just absolutely uh, like didn't know anything about it? This was just like a very superior tier of people who knew about all this and were researching it, and the general population was ignorant of it. I don't mean yeah, ignorant, but didn't know. Yeah, large, yeah, it was largely that. I mean, mm -hmm. understand though, in, in, in countries like Holland was probably a fairly unique case, the Republic, where literacy was probably pretty high and where you didn't have an overwhelmingly large like peasant class. Mm -hmm. But certainly there would have been the educated cl classes of Paris and London would have sufficient literacy mm -hmm. to you know to hear of some of these issues being spoken of at, at dinners and, and that kind of thing. But again, uh, I'm, I'm not well equipped for estimating percentages my guess would be that in the most literate of these societies, it would have been like 10% of the population that was in a position. Wasn't it the case that Newton kept some of his calculus um, secret, even from his contemporaries? Yes, until later on. It all got published later on when I think he felt threatened by the fact that Leibniz <laughs> had published before he did. Beat him to it. <laughs> uh, Lou, I have a question. Did the church immediately uh, embrace uh, most or some or any of these uh, ideas or um, concepts or did it take them forever as usual to, to put I, this? I I'd say, lar I'd say largely, if, if you mean the Roman Catholic Church. Well, the Roman Catholic Church and, and also others, you know, I mean, other, other sects, other, well, other, I mean, yeah. By and, by and but, large. But mostly the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church did take a while to embrace some of this. And, now, and remember, the, the, the Roman Church wasn't monolithic. Uh, so we're talking about the... Yeah. The official voice of the Roman church. Yeah, but still it would take the church to sell it to the populace. In other words, if they said it was okay, then everybody would think it was generally right. okay. Right. There, there were, there were uh, members of the Jesuit order who were very sophisticated and scientists in their own right who were quite in line with this. But certainly this would not have received the blessing of the bishops in, in any of the general large public arenas. Interestingly enough, the ideas get accepted more readily in Northern Europe and some of the Protestant countries, certainly uh, Holland and, and England, but I would say Germany as well. And I'm not sure what that means, other than the fact that uh, the, the Protestant churches, the more radical ones in Northern Europe, were sort of locked into a kind of uh, fundamentalism that would just have ignored this whole arena. Uh, 
from the beginning, but there was this other class at the universities and that would embrace these ideas. And maybe, maybe you know, I, I know it was a case in the Middle Ages where the Franciscans, because they adopted a less rationalist theory of how God is embraced by humans, theirs was a, a, a more mystical, direct theory. It allowed the Franciscans to become scientists because they they weren't they weren't weighed down by a rationalism that had to explain everything. So since they believed that 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 their connection to God was sort of mystically and intuitive, as far as the rational analysis of the universe went, this left them an open field to do science of a sort. So the Franciscans made better physical sciences in the Middle Ages. I don't know that this was still true in, in, in different populations in the 17th century. But what is clear is that The, the product of this is not so much, I can't stress this enough, the product of this kind of thinking isn't so much opposition to traditional religious belief, but a kind of switching of away from the focus on religious belief. It, it basically became an issue of um, I'm otherwise preoccupied. My thoughts have moved to this new climate of opinion. I'm now more concerned with whatever. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. That, I mean, think of our own society. Here we are in a country that has a significant point uh, percentage of its population dedicated to uh, fundamentalist religious belief who seem to be able to carry their way through life worried about, you know, everything from NFL scores to uh, political infights to uh, arguments about what's permissible for adolescent fashions in in schools, to God knows what, but and you and you think about well, wait a minute. If 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 the central guiding force of your life was was this belief and a heavy belief in a transcendent God in the eleventh century or the tenth century, somebody who had that kind of born again experience went off to a convent or a monastery, not to, not to a jet not scan. Not to political office, not to high political office. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it, 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 it's, it's a kind of never-mindedness, you know? And in the, and, and the 17th century, when, when I say there's a, the, the, when I will argue later on that this kind of the beginnings of a creeping secularism, it isn't an it isn't a denial of religion. It isn't A and non-A. It's B and C and D. It's like, let's change the conversation. And and all it's not A or non-A, you know, it's not binary. And so the focus moves to another plateau where less of people's working moments are spent focused on. Those issues. So for so for instance, when you ask a question about the Roman church's attitude towards this stuff, the Roman, by the time the Roman church ever gives its blessing to the new science, by that point, almost everybody in the church has rendered the question irrelevant. They've, they've moved on. <laughs> they've moved on. You know, by, by the time the, the church gets around to saying it's okay, people are more concerned with buying 
the latest BMW. <laughs> you know, they moved to another and platform. It's, and, it's also, and it's also true that uh, I'm, I'm, I think that in, in many of the universities, the the teachers, the professors, the lecturers were um, uh, were were uh, either uh, in a religious order or they were they had some office of in the church. That's right, and and so they were they were they were of the church, and yet they were and they were teaching these new philosophies, these new sciences. Right. So they had to be part of. I mean, they had a, a, a foot in both in in both camps, so to speak. That's right. No, that's right. And they managed to compartmentalize it very neatly, as we do as moderns. Yeah. You know so. Yeah. Anyhow, we've hit three o'clock. So. Okay. On, Thank you. On. It was an excellent dis discussion. See you next week. Bye-bye.